good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to TIFF Bell Lightbox. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the CEO here at TIFF. I want to thank you all for joining us for this very special uh, event in conversation with Ruth E. Carter. As you join us today, we always invite um, everyone to join us in taking a moment to reflect on the land that we are on and its history and uh, and its meaning for us. Uh, we are located in Toronto, as you may know, on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of, of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. And this territory is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, and it's home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We're proud and uh, honored to be on this land and to be presenting the work of Indigenous storytellers and artists. Tonight's event is very special because it connects us directly to TIFF's mission, which is to transform the way people see the world through film, and uh, for their help in uh, our doing that. We want to thank our members, our donors, our supporters, uh, maybe some of you tonight, for championing our mission and supporting our campaigns such as Every Story and Share Her Journey that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging in film and by challenging the status quo, celebrating diversity, and creating opportunities for women and other equity-seeking creators. If you'd like more information on that, you can visit tiff.net slash support. We also want to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, and our major sponsors, RBC, Visa, and Bulgari and also our public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, Telefilm Canada, and the City of Toronto for their continued support. Some news tonight before we begin. Ruth E. Carter flew into Toronto, but she is not feeling well. Um, she would love to be here with you in person, but even though she's not feeling well, we decided we would go ahead with the event, but we wanted to be cautious. Um, she is going to be speaking to you live from her hotel room here in the city, uh, but not here on stage. Um, and, but she is still ready to give you the goods on her remarkable career from school days and Malcolm X to Ryan Coogler's Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Have you seen Wakanda Forever yet? Yes? All right, good. So you're going to learn more about it tonight. Over the past 35 years, Ruth E. Carter's work in film and television has been incredibly influential as she continues to redefine the art of costume design with every new project that she takes on. To introduce and uh, speak with Ruth, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage uh, your host for tonight's event. Suzanne Boyd is the editor-in-chief of Zoomer magazine, and prior to this current role, she was the editor-in-chief of Suede magazine and of Canada's fashion bible, Flair. Suzanne was the first person of color to edit a, uh, and helm a major uh, national Canadian publication. Her writing has also appeared in Maclean's, Toronto Star, The Oprah Magazine, and Vogue. And as one of Canada's original influencers, before that was a thing, Suzanne regularly appears on TV, radio, and digital platforms, providing commentary on politics, pop culture, everything in between. And she's often frequently named to multiple best dressed lists, which is, of course, very important for tonight's conversation. I think she's the perfect person to speak with Ruthie Carter. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne Boyd. Yeah. Wow. Look at this crowd. Hello. Thank you, Cameron, for that very generous introduction. I've always been inspired by your leadership and your commitment to excellence through your platform here at TEF. And I'm really thrilled here to be here today in the building that will soon house the Viola Desmond Theatre. Cameron, if you're still there, I remember you saying at the announcement that it had always struck you that Ms. Desmond was attempting to see a movie when she was racially profiled and arrested for sitting in the whites-only part of a Nova Scotia cinema which led to her life of activism and the genesis of the Canadian black rights movement. Being in the fashion industry, adjacent via publishing, I was always struck by the fact that she was a hairdresser. Just as I was struck that Rosa Parks, who refused to give up her seat on that bus, thus catalyzing the American civil rights movement, was a dressmaker. These arts and crafts are so integral to the success and reception of a film, and many an actor says that they do not have a figurative entry into the character until they literally walk in that character's shoes. 
they're going to need a costume designer for that. And no one does it like Ruthie Carter, the woman we are here to hear from today. From the moment Dap, played by Lawrence Fishburne, appears as the first character on screen in Ruth's first film, Spike Lee's School Days, in a graphic t-shirt that immediately telegraphs who he is and what he stands for, to, look of, to the look of her final scene of her latest film, Ryan Coogler's Black Panther Wakanda Forever, where Letitia Wright as Princess Shuri and Lupita Nyong'o as Nakia are dressed in a way to allow a transcendent human moment between the characters to take up the space, Ruth Carter's work has modeled range, rigor, specificity, and vision. Her work leaves the realm of fashion, though it can be incredible fashion if it's called for, and goes beyond style, although it is incredibly stylish in the quality of the execution and how the characters live and move when costumed. Instead, her work rises to the level of storytelling in itself, as seen through the 70 credits in over three decades in film, television, and theater that she has worked for. And her intellectual approach and her nuanced, impeccable taste has been called on by key Hollywood directors, and her work has been a power player in some of the most relevant films of our time. As The New Yorker put it, Carter's work is rooted in an understanding of fashion as a crucial construction of the black self and in meticulous realism and historical research. To me, all can see that her costume design amplifies the message of cinema that centers capital B black experience in its many permutations. It distills and illustrates black joy and black pain, sometimes at the same time as it bears witness to our past, reflects and questions our present, as well as outfitting us all for a better Afrofuturistic world we can all live in together. And if that wasn't enough, she gave the culture the best Halloween cons costume inspiration of all time, that of Nizzy and Mickey from the cult classic Baps. For her body of work, she has received an Emmy nomination for the reboot of the 2016 The Miniseries Roots. She has been nominated for three Oscars in 2019 and winning in 2019 for Black Panther, making history as the first black person to win the category of Best Costume Design and also earning Marvel Studio its first Academy Award. She's on the Board of Governors for the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. She was awarded the Costume Designers Guild Career Achievement Award in 2019 and her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2021. And as 2022 draws to a very cinematic close, she honors us by joining us here today. Please join me in welcoming Ruthie Carter. Hey. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi. Um, happy to be here. I wish I could be in person, but thank you for that really wonderful introduction. As I listened to all the things that you said, it just uh, reminded me of all the reasons why I love this uh, art of costume design and all of the reasons why from the very beginning I got into this, uh, into this profession. And, and, you know, our past and our history is a big part of who we are, and it's a big part of why I want to honor who we are. Well, we are so happy to see you with that beautiful, evocative mood board behind you, as of course you would have. And we want to honor you too. And I just remember, do you remember speaking with me back in 2018 when you came to Toronto? I do, I oh, do. Good. That was a while back before the Oscar. Right, yeah. and we went out to dinner after and I said to you, the Oscar, the Oscar's coming. And you were, <laughs> you were so zen about it. And you said, if it happens, it happens. And it happened, so congratulations. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, you know, you you realize all on your journey that you can't think about the awards in their in their wonderful uh, when they come, but the real true reward is to actually manifest your work mm -hmm. on screen. Well, you've done that in so many beautiful ways, but I still want to focus on you and ask you the fashion question because I mean. It's, it's a moment, you've dressed so many characters for historic moments, and here are you in your life on the, you were on, on that night on the eve of, of a historic moment. And mm -hmm. how do you decide what to wear? Because you're not only dressing for the occasion, you're dressing for this moment, this moment that's sort of converged in your person. And so how did you, you have so many options, how did you decide what to wear? 
Well, if that was the only occasion, it would have been one straight story. But mm. um, because I was a front runner, uh, there were several occasions that led up to mm. the Oscar right. night. So I had many dresses that mm -hmm. were in construction, as well as things that I was wearing to other events. Like I got the Tr Critics' Choice Award. Mm -hmm. uh, I got the Costume Designers Guild Award. And so um, we were constantly manifesting ideas mm -hmm. and um, I had to bring together a big team to mm -hmm. uh, help me mm -hmm. uh, realize like what I was going to mm -hmm. wear, which was the hardest job yeah, of my whole career. <laughs> I know. Well, you never look at yourself. So you and the dress you ended up wearing to the Oscar, I, I just loved it. It was so regal, majestic. I think it had a call back to the movie and how it was styled with that incredible yeah. neck piece. And yeah. I, I, you worked with B. Michael on it. And yeah. B. Michael, I know him. I worked with him when we did a cover with Cecily Tyson, the last editorial she did before she passed. And he all he her courier. What made yeah. you want to work with B. Michael for this? very special occasion, this special moment in your life? Um, I liked the way he dressed Cicely. I thought she always mm -hmm. looked really classy and mm -hmm. beautiful, regal. Um, she was, it never looked like she was in a costume or it always fit her. Mm -hmm. And so I was very excited about um, being uh, dressed by him. I knew him from our experience together on Sparkle. Mm -hmm. So I knew the quality of his work. And so he was the perfect choice. Yeah, I mean, he, you guys nailed it naturally. And I, I just think that, you know, you posted a little while ago about what is your outfit. When you put on your garment, what is it saying about you? What is the story you wanted to tell? And I think we could all see from that look, the story you wanted to tell, the story you have been telling. So thanks for that moment. It was amazing. I was screaming in my apartment, just like, oh, she did it, she did it. Yeah. So, and I mean, if your life was a biopic, that would be, you know, the Hollywood ending, literally, the actual Hollywood ending, you know, the triumphant Oscar night. But it, it was never a dream of yours to work in film. So how did you, let's, if we rewind and start at the beginning, uh, how did you, how did you start in this business? I mean, starting even before your original work, when you, how did you fall in love with clothes? How did you know that fashion would be the medium from which you'd express yourself as an artist? Well, I'm, I'm growing up, I was always the anti-fashion. I, <laughs> I, I wasn't the girl who was in uh, like the vintage Chanel boots. I was the girl who was in Jabot jeans mm -hmm. and I was, uh, I loved Madonna, mismatch earrings, and mm -hmm. I came up through the 80s. And, you know, a lot of people think that I got into costume design because I love fashion, mm -hmm. you know, Dior and the Alexander McQueen. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was actually the writers, the storytellers of, mm -hmm. you know, my, my, uh, my past, my, mm -hmm. what my, my family influenced me to mm -hmm. read, James Baldwin, mm -hmm. Nikki Bonnie, Sonia Sanchez. I mean, I could see the 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 writing of, of Mother to Son, James Baldwin's mm -hmm. Mother to Son. Mm -hmm. I could see the the Crystal Stairs. I could mm -hmm. see the Revolution. Mm -hmm. I, I I went to see all of the black exploitation films mm -hmm. and uh, the music of Curtis mm -hmm. Mayfield mm -hmm. told the story of my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Told the story of my mm -hmm. culture. Um, and, and I wanted to, um, get into the drama of mm -hmm. art and, mm -hmm. and how that manifests itself mm -hmm. as characters, as people, as real people. And it wasn't until I met Spike Lee, mm -hmm. um, in the eighties after, you know, training in, in mm -hmm. school and getting out there and driving across country mm -hmm. in my little Volkswagen rabbit mm -hmm and going to the opera and doing internships. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I met Spike Lee that we, he, he showed me that I could, I could be one of those activists mm -hmm. that I read about, that mm -hmm. I knew about, that mm -hmm. was trying to mm -hmm. uh, uh, show ourselves on screen the way we saw ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. Spike Lee's direction, that mm -hmm. we're going to show ourselves on camera mm -hmm. the way we see ourselves because at that time in the uh, early 90s mm -hmm. you know it was all gang banging mm -hmm. and it, mm -hmm. it was not very positive mm -hmm. so you had like the Cosby show you had things in television mm -hmm. but you didn't have it in film 
it's a so I fit in, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it fit for me. It was a great fit for me. And how did you meet him? Like, uh, like I always like, if it was again a movie, like, what, what were you uh, walking down the street and in, in, in at a party? Like, how does this happen? Oh, how do you yeah. connect with Spike Lee for this amazing? collaboration over 12 films to happen starting with well, school days i was a costume designer for a mm -hmm. dance company in south central la mm -hmm. and it was in a small studio the lula washington dance academy it was in south central um the, the choreographer was this guy otis salid it became very very popular there were limousines lining the streets wow. of south central to get into this little dance studio to see this performance to the music of Stevie Wonder. Oh, wow. And it was something to watch. And I went every night to watch the performance mm -hmm. that I was also the costume designer mm -hmm. for. And Spike came to see one of the performances. Mm -hmm. And uh, I he was not known. He had not shown the world she's got to have it. Mm -hmm. um, and there was uh, two other friends of mine with him. Uh, one was a lighting designer, and mm -hmm. I had I always kept my portfolio with me. Oh wow! And I showed my friend my portfolio at intermission, and I was asking her questions because, like, I was in LA trying mm -hmm. to get work in theater as a costume designer, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of theater. Yes, in. you think you'd be go to New York for that? Yeah, right? you yeah. know, but I drove. <laughs> I, you know, I it's a long story. Yeah. So, um, so Spike was there and he was looking at my book as I was showing her mm -hmm. all the things I had done on spec. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, afterwards, we all went out to a club. And as you said, we 80s. Went to a club. Yeah, in the 80s. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he was dancing. I kept thinking, this guy keeps asking me to dance. I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, you know, and he was telling me how to get more film experience. Yeah. He yeah. was like, Ruth, you know, go to USC, go to UCLA, mm -hmm. go to their film study department, mm -hmm. sign up to do, mm -hmm. to work on someone's mm -hmm. student uh, senior thesis project. Mm -hmm. You'll be on set. You'll have, be around all the same equipment that mm -hmm. everybody, you know, in Hollywood uh, uses. And I was thinking, why is this guy talking to me mm -hmm. about movies? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm into, I'm into theater. I'm a thespian. Wow. And, uh, but I did. And yes. I knew it on the weekends. I was, you know, on a set hearing, you know, cut and quiet mm -hmm. on the set. Right. But it was um, maybe a year later mm -hmm. uh, that he brought uh, his film to Cannes Film mm -hmm. Festival and mm -hmm. he won the Grand Prix. Right. And then early one morning he called me and uh, I it was like before the sun came up. Mm. And I answer the phone and someone's on the other side, you know, Ruth. And I'm like, hello, Ruth, <laughs> hello, Peter. Ruth, this is the man of your dreams. Uh. <laughs> like that, did that? <laughs> he must have loved that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, this is fight. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I want you to do my next movie, School Days. And so School Days was my first project. Well, it's funny. I've been on the phone with Spike Lee, and he was like, I don't want to talk to you. Oprah's making me. It was for <laughs> the magazine. But he then gave the most generous interview. And I think the lesson just before we get into School Days from listening to you is like, always be ready. Be ready. Don't get ready. Be ready. There you were with your book looking for opportunity and made the most of when that opportunity came to you. And School Days is so interesting because it was said in, you know, we all know the story, right? It's at the HBCU and you had gone to Hampton. And so was it because you knew that environment and had actually lived that environment in university, did it make it easier as your first job? Even though I'm sure it was a heavy lift, it was a big cast, lots of extras, lots going on in terms of costuming, but because you had that environment in your background, that collegiate experience at the HBCU, did that help the process? Yeah, that was one layer that helped mm -hmm. the process. But mm -hmm. I had already been doing Shakespeare and mm -hmm. Moliere, and I had come out of the opera where mm -hmm. there were huge choirs and ah. we were building them from the ground mm -hmm. up. And we had to do character arcs, mm -hmm. even though we weren't the designers, mm -hmm. we were in an internship program mm -hmm. that was training mm -hmm. you to 
understand the mm -hmm. medium of uh, character development and costume design. Mm -hmm. So that part of it didn't intimidate me, the size. And also the fact that I had gone to an HBCU, but, you know, I was a theater girl, you know, so I wasn't doing the sorority thing, but I was around it. Um, and so it did create an environment for me to use my imagination mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. use the creativity and implore that into mm -hmm. the building of these character mm -hmm. arcs and these characters. So I actually um, was asked to do school days when Spike mm -hmm. called me and mm -hmm. I went to my brother's place mm -hmm. in New Hampshire mm -hmm. and he had a studio there. Mm -hmm. He's an artist, a fine artist. Mm -hmm. And I drew every character oh, in wow. school days. And then I got on a plane, flew into New York and called Spike for our meeting uh, to show him everything. My brother had given me this gigantic portfolio. I mean, I don't know what kind of artist has the size, the size and scope of this portfolio. But I had all my drawings there and, yeah. you know, I went to Spike's little basement apartment in Brooklyn mm -hmm. And I presented all, all of mm -hmm. it. And, and my brother told me to have him sign the ones that, mm -hmm. you know, anything that he says is okay, you have him sign it. Mm -hmm. And so he was signing and taking pictures mm -hmm. and I spread them all over mm -hmm. the floor of his mm -hmm. apartment. I'm obsessed with, I just looked at it um, just recently and I'm obsessed with what it looks like. It looks so modern even today. I mean, the, the proportions of those great varsity jackets, the styling, the pattern, how you made everything pop. And I'm obsessed with that Lawrence Fishburne t-shirt because that graphic right in the middle, it looks just like Virgil Abloh's you know, oh, yeah. the graphic <laughs> off-white. And yeah, I just, off yeah, and have you, did have you, you must have noticed that before, right? Or I I'm going to look at that again. That yeah. was a symbol flag, a Soweto yeah. uh, uh, divest now. A lot yes. of the graphics, I don't think that one in particular was, I think I bought that one, mm -hmm. but most of the graphics were mm -hmm. uh, original uh, mm -hmm. that I created because mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. staying my brother for a little bit of the prep and doing a lot of graphics mm -hmm. with him because he was a he he was trained as a graphic artist as well. Mm -hmm. And so I mean the thing about that felt I think everyone remembers that scene in the hair salon. Um, uh, yeah. You know there had to be a hair salon right and you know the Madame Riri and there's that showdown between the different factions and um, it's just so interesting. It's, you know, it's a satirical take on some very painful things in our community. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, you know, verbal violence, you know, <laughs> with colorism and texturism. And it's just so fascinating, you know, how you outfitted them. Like, it was like athleisure. Um, could you talk a bit about that before we look at a clip? Well, you know, Spike is a big athletic fan. Mm -hmm. He's an athlete. I mean, mm -hmm. he's not an athlete. Let me correct myself. <laughs> he is a fan of the athlete. And so that's always like in the uh, world of what you build with Spike. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, we were working with a company to do our uh, football, um, our, our Letterman jackets. Mm -hmm. He wanted to have the hockey jerseys on mm, the girls. Mm -hmm. So I uh, put together the colors and we put a small J for the mm -hmm. blues and a, a capital W mm -hmm. for the wannabes. And, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it was about numbers for me at this time because mm -hmm. there were so many dancers. Mm -hmm. So we put, uh, we, I, I, I paired it with, mm -hmm. The, um basically mm -hmm. like tights and and athletic uh athletic bras mm -hmm. and then a little did I knew they were going to take their hockey jerseys off halfway through that number and <laughs> I was glad that everything matched up but right. you know, back then I I you know I had worked with dancers a lot mm -hmm. from my the time when I met Spike and I kind of knew how, you know, they need certain things to actually, like an athlete, they need certain things to actually dance. And, and it was such an unusual choice to make it athletic. It looked so fresh and modern and also fantastical because they were changing out of their normal college gear to go into the satirical headspace. And it yeah. was a bit of a fantasy, but it was still so grounded. So we're going to yeah, look at... Yeah, so we're going to look at a clip, and at the same time, we're going to look at a clip from another film you did with Spike, which got you your first Oscar nomination, Malcolm X. So mm -hmm. we'll look at School Days, then we'll look at two clips from Malcolm X, and then we'll talk about Malcolm X on the other side. 
Okay. And we're going to go, should I describe my club? Or, okay, so Malcolm X is a completely different vibe, as we say. And it's, you know, what was so interesting about it was mm -hmm. the character arc. It's, it's his true life. You know, Denzel Washington in an award. You were nominated for an Oscar. He was nominated for an Oscar playing this character. And I think he's just at the height of his charisma in this film. It's just crackling off the screen. He brings this character to life. And we have two clips. And one of them, he's Malcolm Little before he, you know, transforms his life and his thinking. And there's a scene where he's with Spike Lee, who plays Shorty. And I think it's one of the best fashion moments in film. That scene in the Zoot Suits, where, you know, go away, Naomi Campbell, go away, the Paris runway, the way these men are strutting down the street. Oh, yeah. They are feeling it. And, you know, the way you built, you know, the Zoot Suits were a thing at that time, and they were controversial, and young men of color who wore the Zoot Suits were often targeted for violence. Mm -hmm. And so when you built those suits um, for Spike and Denzel to wear, was it actually what they would have worn, or was this heightened reality to make the point for film for contrast? No, um, I read the autobiography of uh, Malcolm X uh, by Alex Haley, and mm -hmm. he describes in detail the color and the mm. look of the first zoot suit that, um, Mal that, he, that Malcolm X that re received. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it was powder blue. Mm -hmm. and so I built a powder blue a zoot suit. I also... Uh, went into the uh, menswear archives that described in detail the um, the measurement of the pant at the ankle, the measurement of the pant at the knee, the height of the pant uh, above the waist, the length of the chain, the coat, the length of the coat. I was very detailed about mm -hmm. uh, reconstructing this uh, piece of history because I, it was important to me. It was important to the culture. Mm -hmm. And it was important also that this uh, iconic look um, be represented properly. So it was straight out of mm -hmm. the uh, exact um, mm -hmm. history of that suit. Now, what may have been heightened mm -hmm. is that they popped away from everyone else. And yes. that's, that's a poetic choice that is done with film when you want to track a character mm -hmm. and so we track the leads our heroes sometimes with color and color helps you do that you'll see that in wakanda forever you see that in mo better yeah. blue you'll see that yeah. in a lot of my films that you can actually track the hero right. with you know the color choices Oh, the clip is okay. So we'll go to the clip now to see what we're talking about, and then look at another clip and talk about that on the way up, on the other side. Thank you. Wow, do you see what I mean about the zoot suits? <laughs> um, Ruth, such beautiful work. Could we talk about the contrast of the scenes in terms of the color and what those? tones feel like and what it meant to the story? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I divided Malcolm X's life into uh, four parts. One uh, part was his early years where he was uh, known as this dancer in the dance halls and it was very flashy with zoot suits. And then there was the uh, where he was Detroit Red. Um, and then when he goes to New York and he uh, he gets together with the hustlers and the guys uh, and he um, has this part of his life where it changes from uh, a little a little less dressed up, a little less, you know, a little disarmed. Um, and so it's a little simpler, but I do have some favorite scenes in this section of, of the story where one in particular, where we see this beautiful blue velvet dress mm -hmm. and in a bright red shirt, but you know, he's actually being trained by the, by Delroy Lindo's character. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to take him from the zoot suit guy to the the trainee or mm -hmm. the younger the younger self, and then they're in course incarcerated where they're in jail and everything is blue denim blue mm -hmm. with 
with white t-shirts. Mm -hmm. So the palette is cleansed. Everything is everything of the past is no longer ah. it's very monochromatic. Mm -hmm. And then we emerge from prison as a, a member of the Nation of Islam, mm -hmm. where it almost becomes like a black and white film. You mm -hmm. see more grays, you see more shirts and ties. Mm -hmm. And he enters into that section of the story at Elijah Muhammad's uh, residence. He's mm -hmm. going to meet him. And I remember wanting to give him some a suit that's you know a little mm -hmm. bigger that is ill-fitted mm -hmm. and when i saw denzel performing you know in the suit and he was so humble and and kind of leaning forward and mm -hmm. head bowed and and tears crying um because he was meeting uh his idol mm -hmm. and um and so from there on, we crafted the mm -hmm. story of this national mm -hmm. uh, speaker for mm -hmm. the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then uh, there's actually another section when he mm -hmm. goes to Egypt on the yeah. Hajj to mm -hmm. Mecca. And at and, and that point, I wanted to bring back some of the mm -hmm. color. So mm -hmm. you'll see in, um, in the desert scenes where um, not only is he given the uh, Arab mm -hmm. uh, garb, mm -hmm. it's the red mm -hmm. scarf. And all of that is coming straight out of, you know, pictures that I've I yeah. collected of Malcolm mm -hmm. X. But I also gave him a color, a pink tie mm -hmm. that was very um, uncharacteristic of his mm -hmm. life and of, especially of his time as mm -hmm. at, in of Islam, because I wanted to show that he was changing. Yeah. yeah. And then my, one of my absolute favorite scenes mm -hmm. in the film is in the airport when he returns from Egypt, he mm -hmm. returns. From Mecca, he's greeting his uh, his wife and kids, mm -hmm. and some of the brothers that left the nation with him mm -hmm. are there, and everyone's casually dressed. But we see this complete metamorphosis mm -hmm. of of mm -hmm. uh, Zell with the beard, the goatee. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X is completely a different mm -hmm. man. Wow, that is such. I feel as you were talking about it, we could see it, and mm -hmm. I just think. You know, the, the details you talk about, even when I was looking at the film again, it was even the, the flash of the wedding scene, his mother's wedding scene and that beautiful dress and how mm -hmm. much work would have gone into creating even these vignettes that you see on screen for just a second. Oh, yeah. I was in love with James Van Der Zee yes. for a long time. And so creating a 1920s wedding portrait. Yeah. Uh, was giving homage to James yes. Van. Dien. Yeah, and and then I just wonder about the details because in that scene, you know, again, I'm obsessed with the glove because the glove that the glove also has a close up. I mean, Denzel looks fantastic in the sweeping gray coat, the beautifully placed hat and scarf, which is perfect for the close up. But this glove is what signifies the fact that he has all this power. When he a flick of the finger, and you oh, know, it looks like that. that yeah. Was there a lot going into picking that glove to read? at night a black glove there's so many different kinds of black there's so many textures and leather was that a journey or was there just a glove and Sometimes it was there you just gotta leave up to chance you know because it's, it's like 10 below zero it's cold i've got the nation of islam and you know you know 50 guys lined up i've got yeah. a whole i have a whole uh, gathering of people of harlem behind them all right. of those were dressed yes wow so everybody mm -hmm. in that whole scene was dressed mm -hmm. and i'm you know making sure that everybody's hat is right mm -hmm. i mean i have a, a set crew but i'm very much a mm -hmm. hands-on type of person but anything that i had for denzel for malcolm mm -hmm. x was chosen specifically for his character mm -hmm. so we had the right gloves mm -hmm. we, we bought the right nothing is by chance, chance. i don't you know, it's not it's it's not even sometimes brought in until the last minute, and mm -hmm. we, you know, at, at, there's a point when the choreography mm -hmm. and, the, and the everything comes together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that that's the beauty of artists mm -hmm. working together. That mm -hmm. you know, we can all have a common goal. Mm -hmm. And we can all we can actually separate and do mm -hmm. our job separately. Mm -hmm. And then as we come back together and join forces, there are things like a point and mm -hmm. a glove that work really well together. Yeah, there you go. It all comes together. Your vision, your intellect, your attention to detail. And yeah. so let's move on to um, another director you worked with, um, Amistad, Steven Spielberg, Amistad. Oh, yeah, that's what you see here. 
Yes, oh, that is it. Okay, I thought I recognized it. And I think, you know, what was it like? I mean, he's almost like a mythic Spielberg. It's, you know, a mythic status at that time, especially at that time, even now, it's a shorthand for like a mythic sort of director. What was like that working with him stepping onto that set? How was that experience for you? You know, even though I had done, I don't know how many films with Spike before I met uh, Steven Spielberg, like, even my family, they were like, okay, I get it, you work for Spike, but when are you going to work for Steven Spielberg? <laughs> like, like, I wasn't doing legitimate film before yeah. Steven Spielberg came yeah. into my life. And, um, and you know, it, it, was, it was a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I was called to his office for a meeting, and there's no script. You don't get a script. I was just basically reading cliff notes about the Amistad story mm -hmm. when I went in. And um, he was working on Jurassic Park at the time. And I waited for him in a conference, empty conference room. Um, then he came in on his lunch break. Mm -hmm. And he said, Ruth, I really loved your work in Malcolm X. Mm. So, you know, the fact that Steven Spielberg had seen Malcolm X, like, what meant everything. Mm. And um, he said, here, take the script take it home, read it, and let me know like tomorrow or the next day if you want to work with me on this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I could tell you it from the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, Steve... Okay, I'll go home. <laughs> <laughs> I think he wanted to work with you. I mean, what you were bringing to the table, I, the, the film needed. And I mean, it's such an incredible story. Um, the Cliff Notes is, does everyone know the story um, of um, Amistad? And it was a case in 1841 where the Supreme Court sided with um, Africans who had been kidnapped, attempted to be enslaved. They took over the ship. And, um, and it was captured off the coast of the United States, and there was a court case, 1841. And you know, it, it sort of kicks, it was a boon to the abo abo uh, abolitionist movement, movement at that time. And then there you are doing another film, and you did get the Oscar nomination for that as well, in, um, so congratulations. And mm -hmm. then, you, you know, fast forward, you're doing a film with Ava DuVernay, Selma, and mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King III said the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice, but it's mm -hmm. over a hundred years, so it's very, very long and it's still bending. But in 1965, you were tackling, the, it's the same sort of subject matter, but a hundred, over a hundred years later. What does it feel like to work on these big historical films that have so much meaning to the struggle for black equality and to have them come to life through costuming? Like how seriously, how serious is that for you to work on? Well, it goes back to uh, when I started working for Spike, it's show us in the way that is true and uh, in the way that we have not had the opportunity to see ourselves in the past on film. And so uh, I'd already been trained in in-depth research from my theater days. I did A Raisin in the St Sun, Sty the Blind Pig, Shakespeare, Moliere. Mm -hmm. I knew how to research. Mm -hmm. And so the research was fascinating to me. I went into art history and I looked at Blacks in art throughout mm -hmm. the ages. Wow. I was laser focused on the year and the and and how how fashion transitioned from um, from years to years, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was very clear. And um, uh, so with Amistad or with Asoma, I was enamored by the by the truth of the story. You know, they had a lot of real. Um, uh, marchers in um, in Selma who were children when mm -hmm. they marched over the Edmund Pettus Bridge and they brought them in and I dressed them and I mm -hmm. got to talk to them mm -hmm. about their experience. They remembered and they remember the children were put in the back and the mm -hmm. women were put in the back, the men were put in the front. Mm -hmm. And so I had this historic research, but I also had this, mm -hmm. this verbal story that you know, mm -hmm. they were impassioned, you know, to tell the story as they saw it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm out there with Ava and I've got my research and I'm moving people around mm -hmm. because I really just want it to be a replica of mm -hmm. what happened. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so those times, 
mean a lot to me because we're telling history. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of times movies are all that people get. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I saw Lady Sings the Blues, still mm -hmm. one of my favorite films, but I thought that was Billie Holiday. When right. I hear Billie Holiday's music, mm -hmm. Diana Ross is, is different from the real Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm. So I often thought if I were to do that film, I would have mm -hmm. probably done it much different because yeah. I love to see the texture. Mm -hmm. I love to see the strife, you mm -hmm. know, not that I want to um, return to mm -hmm struggle i want to show like the struggle so we know what people had to do to do mm -hmm. what they did mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah and yeah. and and how much harder was amistad because you didn't have that living history that experience of memory um the vis the disparity between what would be visually available to you was so different um i remember you talking once about doing this living history thing in the summers where you yeah. lived in a colonial Williamsburg. Um, did you access that for Amistad, or is that well, just part of your I research? Had, yes, I was an actress on the street of colonial Williamsburg, mm -hmm. and I totally recreated the character I was playing. You know, I made her barefoot, I put a rag on her head, and she was uh, working in fields and in, in uh, gardens and stuff, mm -hmm. and when she saw visitors. But we had to... We had to research those people. They were real people that lived. So I didn't want to play the Disneyland version of mm -hmm. that character. I wanted mm -hmm. to be the person that we researched. And I was working with Black historians mm -hmm. in Colonial Williamsburg that were experts in colonial history of Africans and of slaves and mm -hmm. of Black people who were free. And mm -hmm. I was fascinated by their stories and how mm -hmm. I, I played Benny Wallace, who mm -hmm. was making dresses on the streets of Williamsburg mm -hmm. for like the Jefferson family. And, wow. and you know, she was a dressmaker. So mm -hmm. I wanted to know everything about her and I wanted to be her. And so by costume design, I'm able to actually step inside many of the mm -hmm. characters that are mm -hmm. played inside of a film or a mm -hmm. theater and with Amistad, I had to do more reading. Mm -hmm. I had to do a lot of art history. I looked at a lot of mm -hmm. plates. I mean, yeah. Steven Spielberg sent me all over the world, and I went to the flea markets in Paris and mm -hmm. in London, and I, I collected these etchings, these mm -hmm. like, these mm -hmm. uh, etchings of, of, you know, Africans in, in court. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So all of that actually created this environment, mm -hmm. what I wanted mm -hmm. to see. And also, I looked at the cargo list of the Amistad. Wow. The cargo list told me, because nobody knows when they took over the ship, mm -hmm. what they looked like. Right. They, they circled around the uh, eastern seaboard, mm -hmm. lost for right. days and days. Mm -hmm. You know, weeks. So I looked at the cargo list and they were carrying blankets, they were carrying cotton, they were carrying leather. And so I made very rudimentary shoes and, and some of them were from Sierra Leone, which mm -hmm. was most Muslim country. Mm -hmm. So wrapped their head like Northern Africans. And um, wow. it, was just, it was just, it was so like, you know, rewarding to yes. to to tell the story and base it on real yeah. history and real people. Well, this is a good time to take a look at the clips because when, if you guys notice in the clip from Amistad, everything you were talking about, I was so struck by how textured and details, even within the strictures of the scene, it was, and so, and look for in the co right corner for a specific sort of head wrap that we'll talk about on the other side. And also you'll see a clip from Salma, which shows how fashion, you will see David Oyolowo. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, an extra O. Thank you, I won't say that again. Um, who played Dr. Kim and Carmen Ijogo. Ijogo, Th yes. Thank you, who plays oh, Coretta. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible at names, and be both wonderful Nigerian names, um, as Coretta Scott King. And this scene shows the power of fashion and costume to create feelings of both belonging and alienation. So let's play the beautiful clips. You know, it's not often that fashion, not in a fashion movie, is the, the topic of the conversation and the light it shined on their relationship and their dreams. It's so beautiful juxtaposed with the horror they'd be facing, you know, at home and what would happen in their lives. 
And, uh, you know, it's such a moment. Um, was that a real dress? Um, or was that a replica for what Coretta Scott King was wearing? Um, that was, uh, yeah, that was poetic license. Mm -hmm. They actually, uh, when they went to the, um, why am I drawing the blank? The Nobel, that was at the Nobel. Oh, Nobel, yeah. 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 He yeah. actually wore the tails and she wore a suit. Ah, a okay. And, uh, uh, Ava wanted to elevate it. Mm -hmm. And so I found a beautiful, uh, vintage dress, uh, that, was um you know dry rod but the bead work was mm -hmm. exquisite, exquisite. And we took it apart and we gave we put the bead work back together mm -hmm. and built the dress mm -hmm. so she's a little fancier than she yeah. was in real life i love that it took them off the mountain and made them real and intimate you know mm -hmm. and made them real people but before we move on just back to amistad um, I mm -hmm. want to talk about that head wrap. Um, if you guys noticed, there was an American flag that was mm -hmm. used as a head wrap. What was that? Such a subversive choice. What was the intention in doing that? What was the statement in putting the flag in that scene? Well, that they were in a land that they knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. That they were that they were in a place that that this flag had no meaning for mm -hmm. them. It had no substance. It had no. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it did not voice their 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 rights, mm -hmm. and so this this uh, African um, may have looked at it as a piece of cloth mm -hmm. and wrapped it on his head. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. was the that was the. It wasn't anything that anyone said. Let's do this. It mm -hmm. was just something that. I put together and the actor loved it. So mm -hmm. I couldn't escape it. Every time that guy got dressed, he was like, do you have the flag? You know, <laughs> like, yeah, I've got it. You know, but, USA, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, um, that Selma moment, you know, Ava has just sort of exploded. Um, she's done so much in Hollywood and for women filmmakers, you know, with, with her work with Queen Sugar. And um, you, you told the New York Times, or I think, or the Guardian, that seeing Ava on set was her, at Selma, was her expressing an, her own version of Afrofuturism, which is such a great segue in talking about Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Because um, what a moment that was for us all, what a moment that was in culture. Um, it's a superhero movie, you know, it has an origin story, every superhero. What was your origin story? How did Black Panther come to you? And did it feel like destiny? It um, well, I had never done a superhero mm -hmm. film before. I had just finished Re Roots Reboot. I was in mm -hmm. New York and uh, someone called, my agent called to say that they wanted me to come in and meet in a couple of days mm -hmm. uh, for Black Panther. And I was like, wow, the Black Panther party, that's cool. <laughs> and, uh, so not a Marvel, not part of the Marvel fandom then. Yeah, I was like, why is Marvel doing that? <laughs> and so she said, I'm going to send you some material. There's no script. You don't have a script. So mm -hmm. so I'm on the plane and I'm looking at these like comic book strips and talking about vibranium and, mm -hmm. and Ulysses Claw. And I'm really trying to figure it out. And it's mm -hmm. not coming together at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I land in Los Angeles and I call my brother, who was a police officer at the time. And he calls a couple of other cruisers and they all kind of li line up and they're like shouting to me across the cars into my brother's cell phone about like, and I was like, wow, this is big. <laughs> so uh, I also had to call uh, a, a concept artist that I knew mm -hmm. that were in the Marvel world. And then they explained it to me. See, I grew up like Little Lotta, the Archie, mm -hmm. those were my comic books. Mm -hmm. I had never done a superhero film, so I really said, why? Why mm -hmm. me? You know, why mm -hmm. are they asking me to come mm -hmm. in and meet on this? Mm -hmm. So I go into Marvel, and you know, Marvel is like the CIA, right? I you know. know. <laughs> but that, that, eye, that eye test they give you where the air blows in your eye. Uh, yeah, wow. Well. Like, that's how they give they, they take your picture and put it on an ID card before you can go in and... And so I went in and I sat in front of Ryan Coogler mm -hmm. and, and Nate Moore, who were the executive producers, mm -hmm. and, uh, Ryan being the director. director. And um, Ryan said, Ruth, I really loved your work in Malcolm X. <laughs> there and you so go. That Steven Spielberg had said yeah. like, 
Yes. Uh, you know, 15 years earlier, and he said, you know, I grew up on Spike Lee films. Mm. And, and I was trying to open up a lot of images I had collected on Afro mm -hmm. Future. Like right. I had, you know, Afro Future was in the world of, <clears throat> of you know, ideas. Yeah. You know? And so I collected all this stuff and I couldn't open it because, you know, mm -hmm. you know there's a firewall at Marvel. You can't mm -hmm. just open up like a drop box or yeah. something. And uh, I'm like freaking out because I can't show him my ideas. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I was like a kid when I went to see Malcolm X. And it was it was like a, it was like a celebration in the movie mm -hmm. theater. There were families. Mm -hmm. and I sat on my dad's lap. And he said, when I was a kid, I honestly remember like the costumes. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that just like, ah, uh, yeah. that, that was my aha moment. Yeah also realized that this was a young filmmaker. This mm -hmm. was like another Spike Lee. And mm -hmm. actually I had something that I could offer him. Right. It, it didn't matter that mm -hmm. I didn't do a superhero mm -hmm. film before. It didn't matter. I was mm -hmm. going to build a world based on culture and, mm -hmm. and African tribes. Mm -hmm. And I could do this mm -hmm. with the training and the mm -hmm. experience that I've mm -hmm. had in the past. So we got my, my computer open. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started sharing images, and, and that's how we that's how we got started. Wow! So let's take a look at what we're talking about. So much beauty, so much you know, so much inspiration, so much beauty. I mean, the film came out 2018, two years into the Trump presidency, the rise of anti-black hate. You know, two years before George Floyd, but we saw you know what was happening with you know black um, black people and law enforcement in the states and you, this film comes out why do you think and because of the fashion i think particularly people were so ready to receive that message of joy and beauty and being uplifted and feeling empowered like did you know the clothes would make that much of an impression I, i'm sure you knew you were working on greatness you've been great for so long but this elevation of technology and then you becoming at the, the face of this sort of new movement and this new expression, were you ready for that? Mm. Oh, we can read the answers, yay. Yeah. Oh, that's me talking. <laughs> Yeah, Roots, we can't. I don't think she can hear me. Oh, that's there you go. Oh, uh, did you mute yourself? I love it. <laughs> okay. That's all this technology, and we're still humans, you know. Yeah, yeah I, I mute just in case I have to cough. Yeah. Um, oh, I hope you're feeling okay. I'm feeling fine. I'm um, glad. So, as artists, I think we're always preparing ourselves to do better because mm -hmm. you're never quite, you know, as artists, you're never quite happy. You can always tweak, 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 and then mm -hmm. a movie is taken on and it comes mm -hmm. out. So you get an opportunity to try again. And so this movie was based on, you know, the beauty of Africa and we took 12 tribes and mm -hmm. we dissected that. And, you know, it was a huge undertaking. Um, yes. I didn't, have, I didn't have time to think about, oh, this is going to be a great fashion when it comes mm -hmm. out. I didn't have time to. Right. I just needed to be present with the task at hand, mm -hmm. and it was huge. Mm -hmm. um, the processes that go into making up a superhero mm -hmm. suit, uh, mm -hmm. the layers that go into mm -hmm. that, uh, it was a world that I was being introduced to. Mm -hmm. Also, to train a crew about the African tribes, like, we, you might come from a place of mm -hmm. maybe you know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know nothing. Yeah. And people wanted it to be like coming to America mm -hmm. because that's all we had prior to showing African royalty. Yeah. And I was like walking around my office. This is not coming to America. This is not the Lion King. Yeah. yeah. Tell them. Yeah. Wakanda. Yeah. This is Wakanda. <laughs> yeah. And so not knowing that it, you know, we kind of felt like, we were making, we knew we were making something special, mm -hmm. but 
um, whether the world was going to embrace it or not, mm -hmm. we did not know that. Yeah. Um, and it was just so moving seeing Chadwick Boseman. I mean, when we went out that night in Toronto, I, I remember asking you about him and saying, why is he cast so much? And you said he's just so cool and he's just so talented. And to see him and knowing that you were going into Black Panther Wakanda forever, knowing that this loss was affecting his work family, not just his loved ones, how difficult was walking into that process knowing that grief would be a part of the story? How did you bring that to life through costuming in a way that honored him, but moved the story forward? Well, we started it when he was alive. Mm, wow. And no one knew he was sick. Wow. So we were devastated in August when we got the news and everybody was devastated. And so we had to pause and, mm -hmm. and we waited for Marvel and Ryan to decide whether they were going to uh, go uh, continue with a new story and mm -hmm. what that story were. We were like, what, what could it possibly, how could they possibly do this story mm -hmm. now? Like how, how you can't just do this story without him. And um, what we did have actually to channel our artistic selves, and it's wonderful to have a platform where you could art, you could channel like grief and feelings. And I've always known that about myself mm -hmm. that I take whatever I'm going through mm -hmm. and I put it into the mm -hmm. art. And we had the underwater world of the Mayas. The yeah, amazing. Elves. So they allowed us to focus on that mm -hmm. while they figured out the story because mm -hmm. that was the whole world that we had to unfold. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they came back with a story and we just were crossing our fingers that some of the art that we put together was mm -hmm. actually going to work. And it did. It beautifully, so, beautifully. I mean, and I just, the Angela Bassett, of ness of this character. I mean, you worked before um, with her with uh, what, not just on Black Panther, but on what love has to do with it. But her character, you know, being the wife of a, you know, the daughter, wife, the daughter, then wife, then mother of a king. And then suddenly as Queen Ramonda, she has to step into power. Um, she has to step into power. And the, she was dressed so spectacularly in this film. Can you talk about what you were doing with her character? I mean, I'll just say the shallow fashion thing, that her arms. I mean, does every any 64-year-old woman actor want to show their arms? I mean, it's just, we talked about it and what love has to do with it. But just everything she, everything you put her in was just so majestic. Tell me about, and strong, tell me about what you wanted to do with her character the grieving mother who had to take charge and rule. Mm -hmm. Well, she is, well, I've, I've done five movies with Angela Bassett. Oh, wow. I know her very well. Mm -hmm. And um, her, her upper body strength was, has always been a factor, mm -hmm. um, but has never been um, um, celebrated. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and we enter the UN in a dress that you that reveals her arms, and she's known for those beautiful the mm -hmm. beautiful arms. Um, and I felt like it was a, a sign of her power, of her vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, her headpiece and her neck piece would uh, be would signify that she is now ruling mm -hmm. Wakanda. And you see her next in a uh, gray a silver dress that has one arm exposed. Mm -hmm. and I love that because we see that in the funeral scene as well. Um, and it, it harkens back to a lot of the cross body drapes that you see in African mm -hmm. um, wrappings. And you see that in the um, Hajj, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like a thing. And, and for me, it signified how, you know, women are strong, they're vulnerable, they're beautiful, they're exposed. And also it showed her power, like the power mm -hmm. of the strength of her arm. And um, so I love that that could be kind of a metaphor for mm -hmm. like this woman who is now in power and taking charge and, you know, unapologetic. Unapologetic. And one of my favorite looks, it's not represented here, is when she goes down to Haiti. Spoiler alert, she goes to Haiti 
on a <laughs> on a geopolitical mission, and she's wearing this unbelievable. It's it's I guess her version of casual to me. It's like what a queen like that would wear to her the Caribbean. Disguise. We like to call it her disguise. Her di her disguise. It was just it was it designer. Did it? It looked a bit like Miyaki. Was it Miyaki? Yeah, it was a Miyaki. Yeah, Izzy Miyaki piece. Um, I, it just was. It just fit in so well. Her because it's nothing like how you represented her, and it was just a really beautiful piece. Um, I'm sure um, many of the people here have questions. Um, does anyone have questions? Um, some more about Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, or Black Panther, or anything we spoke about today. Sorry, that was abrupt. We're now going to the question period. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, Since so someone, is there a mic going around? I see there's a question over there. Gentleman in the white hat and the tracksuit top. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so, yeah. Besides, um, your specialty is wardrobe, and um, on film, um, besides the wardrobe and costume, do you ever wish to uh, do um, your artistic ability on um, set deck or vehicles or props or? skyscrapers, anything else besides wardrobe? Um, I always find when I go into a medium that's uh, different, like even in, um, in redecorating the room in my house, I'm like, God, this is hard. Like, how do you figure out the colors? How do you figure out what goes together? Man, this is hard. And then I'm like, hey, you're a costume designer. You do this all the time. But I just can't, um, I just can't apply it to the other disciplines. So, but what I do love is collaboration. And this is a highly collaborative media, medium. And um, I have meetings with props. I have meetings with hair and makeup. I have meetings with the production designer. And I love how we can tell a story within a story. You know, like you think of a big room that's all art deco and you walk into a, a building and it's all art deco and maybe it's 1960, but the still the, the background is this thing that was created, this structure that was created in the 20s and 30s and people are dressed in the 60s. So I love how we can layer layer our stories together. And so I don't think about wanting to do their work. I think about how we can collaborate. What a great question. Oh, lots of questions. Um, OK, the orange gentleman in the orange, beautiful orange hat. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, so Ruth. Hi. So Ruth, mm -hmm. um, I read that you also worked on Coming to America, the Coming to America sequel. How was is, how is that? How's that experience compared to working on Black Panther? Oh, they're so different. Uh, uh, well, it's comedy. Coming to America was a comedy. Uh, it was dealt with, um, you know, with a building a world, but it's a comedy, so it's not as serious, you know? We're only in Akeem's home. We're not actually, you know, battling. There's no... There's no big issue in town or in the kingdom, you know, it's a love story. So as far as the costumes, I still want them to be great. I still want them to be seen. Um, and, you know, with Wakanda forever, you want to bring to people what the first film did, same with Coming to America but we were elevating it. Uh, we were elevating that there's new armor, there's new superheroes, you know, mm -hmm. the Jabari change. And there's, it's just because it's, it's not a comedy, I think makes you take a different approach to it. Mm -hmm. And the seriousness of the detail becomes more important to be connected to the tribes than mm -hmm. coming to America, which I made up a lot of the graphics, you know, I did masks, I did things, I wanted yeah. things to be light and funny and not so serious. Mm -hmm. Yes, the gentleman in the beautiful gray sweatshirt. Ooh, people have beautiful clothes on. Yes, out they do. It's a very fashionable crowd. We dress Hello. for you. Hello, Ruth. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, just your your availability and your time. My question is, when you're working with directors, filmmakers, creatives, 
how do you navigate when you're kind of missing uh, each other in terms of like what the creative outcome is? So, you know, you're working with a filmmaker and maybe what they're articulating, you're not really understanding, or maybe what you've created hasn't really, um, isn't exactly what they're looking for. How do you kind of overcome some of those, those maybe communication or creative challenges? When you do something wrong, <laughs> well, there really is no wrong. There's yeah. No, there's no right. There's uh. all. It's all about perspective. Like, if you communicate something to me and I hear it in one way, and I go ahead and create this thing, and it's not what you said then we have to sort of work together in, in understanding each other and what my, my approach was. So one thing that we do do is a lot of illustrations to kind of bypass some big bad hurdles that could be like disastrous money-wise and otherwise. Mm -hmm. So uh, superheroes are always illustrated, illustrated. Mm -hmm. Hundreds, hundreds of sketches are submitted but when there are those things, there's so many things in world building that I, I've heard Ryan say to uh, AD on set, like, I've never seen that before. I, I never saw that before this very <laughs> second. And I go, oh, God, you know, oh, my God. Um, there comes a time when you go through a lot of uh, 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 communication and research and prep that you start to trust people. Mm. And, you have to have a certain level of trust with your key filmmakers that they're not going to do something so left, or even if they want to, they're going to show you in some mm -hmm. kind of way. So I don't think I've had that experience of, you know, like, what the hell is that? Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't expect it to look like that at all. Before it got to set, maybe there were, you know, 20 illustrations of this one thing mm -hmm. and, and one was chosen and each piece of that puzzle, you start to learn a little bit more about what the director wants. So you gotta yeah. kind of step, you gotta step into this pro process, you know, an inch by inch thing and not just, you know, like, hey, I'm gonna put Queen Ramonda in an Indian mm -hmm. sari, yeah. you know, <laughs> you're not gonna, you're gonna show that in some kind of way. And there are those times when maybe even the director goes, well, that's not what I expected, but it looks good. Mm, yeah. Trust the process. Yeah. Any Sorry, more? that didn't really answer your question. I thought it was a great answer. Did you? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Um, oh, my gosh. Could someone pick someone? I'm so overwhelmed by all the interest in talking to Ruth. Um, okay. Young lady there, the black, beautiful black sleeve. Yeah. Yes, you. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm terrible at picking. It, it's it, it's <laughs> often. No choices. Okay. So much. Hi, Ruth. My name is Charlene. I'm a costume designer um, based out of here and obviously a huge fan. One of my questions was um, when dealing with, I guess, teams that kind of take away your creative control, how do you kind of bring it back and kind of bring your own sauce back to the project when mm -hmm. everything that you've done, everything that you're creating is kind of being taken away from you and they're kind of imposing their ideas on what things should look like? Yeah, I think that's the most heartbreaking thing that a costume designer has to deal with. And that is people not seeing you for what you could give to the project as much as you have you give in, uh, in, a, in, a, in prep or in, you know, bo mood boards and they just don't want to see it. You know, they just want to d be in control, you know, of you. And that's the most heartbreaking um position to be in, but as a professional, you still have to push through. And so the way that I do it um, is I look at the whole picture and I say to myself, they're so focused on those two little parts 
I'm going to give them those two parts. I'm going to let them have complete control of these two characters because it's the lead and the guy wants his girlfriend to play the role and let him go, let him have it, let him yeah, pick yeah, the dress. Yeah. But I'm going to create everything else in my way, in my glorified way. I'm going to I'm going to appease what I feel inside that this piece needs by taking not necessarily a backseat because they don't realize how important all the elements of the film um, uh, are, 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 how important all of these elements of the film are. They're just so focused on like, you know, you know, I did, you know, I did the main character. I thought of the main character myself and I wanted to be in a leather dress, you know, or I want him to have a tank top on. And uh, I just have to you know, like step back when it's complete, like they want to control your life and they want to control everything you do. And, and you're no longer a designer. You're kind of like a puppet. Mm -hmm. Then you just have to breathe. You got to breathe your way through it. It's not going to be the best picture that you ever did, but sometimes we have to stay on these jobs and like actually try to see something that they see and just get through it and, and know that the next one is going to be yours. Wow. Okay, you. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. That's such a beautiful lesson for us all to take in. Okay, then you next. Hi, Ruth. You next. Okay. Hi, my name is Wafa, and my question is, when you're reading about uh, a character, does it translate to you from uh, words into an image right away into your head, or do you have to see a lot of fabrics and textures? I saw a video of you when you were shopping in the markets in Africa, and you saw the gold bangles, and you said, this is the Dora Milaje. <laughs> like, did you, did you have like a picture ahead of time, or was it like the decision made when you saw those, you were like, that's it, I'm sold? <laughs> um, well, Marvel's a different way of working, I mean, so I'm going to answer that more organically and more in line with the experiences that you will probably have more often than not. You know, with Marvel, they, they come up with concept sketches and you're constantly being flooded with things as you're reading, you know, so it's a whole other kind of a, uh, answer. But uh, the uh, characters do come to me vibrantly as I read them. So I don't know specifically, but I do know vibrantly. I know how their mood is by when I read them, I can see them as a, uh, as a light, you know, as a color. As a, so with the Dora Milaje, um, the illustration when I was shown the drawing, uh, they were in a field and they were, you know, concept art and, you know, you couldn't see the feet and they were kind of brownish and a little reddish, but brownish. And I, I had seen them in vibrant color and I thought I want them to be more Maasai. I'm reading this story about Africa and I'm thinking about like, Whew, in the ballet colors and Maasai colors. So the first thing that I wanted to do was up the color, you know, bring in the Maasai red, bring in that vibrant red. And also the armor was to be like jewelry. So all of that um, leaped off the page. And I wasn't sure how it would all apply but as we went through this process of piece by piece, when I saw the Himba women and how they used the shea butter and the clay soil and they mixed it and they put it all over their skin, I was like, that's another color that I, I need to have on the Dora Milaje. So there's like a vibrancy to reading if it's not specific, because you don't really know specifics until you do the research. I can just see it all. Um, gentleman in the blue shirt. And then the lady, Linda, beside him. Okay. After. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Ruth. Yeah. Hi. Um, the work you've done, Ruth, has obviously been very all over the place in terms of genre, scale, tone. Um, generally, when you're in a major motion picture with a major studio, what does your team look like? How many people do you have working with you that you have in different roles? Like what, what, I guess, is your essential crew in the costume department? 
I should have asked that question, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, um, I have to look at the whole uh, accomplishment, what we need to accomplish. And I will outsource. The, there are certain things I will, I will push outside of my immediate world. And that's because the panther suit is going to be made at this place or the, you know, midnight angel is going to be done at that place. And then I have this other big, huge um, uh, uh, thing of things I have to do without lack of a better word of saying that. Um, and so I, de I develop a team. Uh, a lot of people return from other movies. And so I will have maybe five ACDs, that's assistant costume designers. Mm -hmm. They're all tasked with different things. Some are great sourcers, shoppers. Some are great organizers of fabrics. Some are just, you know, great, you know, get inside my head and sort out all that confusion. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a floor of uh, dressmakers. There's probably 15 on that floor, two head cutters, and they both have a team that can be around seven people a piece. And uh, then there's a tailor shop where I'll have a tailor one or two and they usually only have a couple people. Tailoring is just like a, it's, like, it's such an art, mm -hmm. you know? It's not like dressmaking where it can be like big and wow, let's get it. Mm -hmm. uh, tailoring is just in like, ooh, it's an art. So I have a tailor, it was uh, completely accomplished and he only works with a couple people, you know? It's amazing how much he can get done. Mm -hmm. um, and so then there is a specialty shop uh, that works with 3D printers and on computer. And uh, all the specialty work is there's clay work, you know, clay molds being um, done, there's sculpting being done, there's work, working with leather, working with all different types of materials. Um, and that's a, that's a room of about five or six people. Um, there's also an aging, dy aging and dying department. Um, and we, we look very much like, you know, your local laundromat with, you know, 15 washers and 15 dryers. And uh, there's about six or seven people in there. There's a head dyer. She has a first hand. And then there are people who are doing all kinds of stuff that I used to do, like, you know, little paint work on stuff. Um, there's an intake department that our PAs and our costumers, when we have fabrics that are coming in, when we have uh, trims and notions and all that that's coming in from outside, because I do have ACDs in other cities and other countries. Yeah. Um, and they are constantly sending things to our shop. So all in all, there's about 30, 30 people in-house. Mm -hmm. uh, there's usually uh, about five or six people in LA. Uh, there's a couple of people, five or three or four in, um, in New York. And you're talking about a big motion picture. That's the, pay that's yes. the picture I'm painting. Because I have been the age of dyer and the <laughs> specialty costumer on other shows. But, um, uh, you know, the world is very big that we're mm -hmm. building. We have a whole department of people that just fit people every day as they come mm -hmm. in. And that's another team of five or six. So we're, we're constantly like moving. There's, there are illustrators mm -hmm. around the world. That's kind of what COVID helped us understand that we don't have to have our illustrators right under our mm -hmm. nose that I can use it. I had a Canadian illustrator on coming to America. Yeah. I have a guy yeah. who's in <laughs> Siberia. I have a guy who's in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. I have, they're all over the place. You know, I'm just looking for talent. Yeah. I think people here tonight will be reaching out to you now that we have this information. So, <laughs> so, so we have time for one more question. Um, Linda Carter. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Okay. Thank you so much, Ruth. Can we have so one more Ruth. after Linda? Just one more after Linda. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for being here. It's been Sorry. amazing. We've really, really enjoyed it, and I hope you're feeling better. Thank you so much. I wish I could be there in person. Oh, you're here. Um, question, what is your favorite area to work in? What is your favorite time of the world, time of life to work in? Uh, area meaning what area of my department or what area of the world did I have the most fulfillment? No, like what, say like what decade, like um, you did Amistad, uh, you done 
Black Panther, like what is your favorite? What would you do for free? Oh, I would do it all for free. Mm -hmm. I, I like to say I don't have a favorite because I have a unique experience with each thing. And each thing brings me some kind of joy that even today, looking at all of these clips, I, I just go back to them and I just remember a lot of the heart and a lot of the love that went into those scenes and creating those costumes. And I really am reminded that I am doing something that I really, really love to do. Um, and so, but I would say that working on Wakanda Forever allowed me to have the freedom to create worlds that are futuristic, that are fantasy, but also I could go back and look at research and history and bring things forward that were from the tribes. I had purpose. And um, I would say, if I have to say favorite, I would say the futuristic. or anything from any of your films? You have. Uh, what's that? Um, she asked if you ever, think, ever thought of doing a line of clothing or accessories from the films, and you do have a Black Panther line. I do. You did? <laughs> did you not have one? Okay. Uh, I'm not into that. No? Okay. I My mistake. I was anti-fashion. Didn't I tell you I was the anti-fashion? You're absolutely anti-fashion. That's why I made that mistake. But I think, so to cover that mistake, let's have one more question. <laughs> so we go out on a high. <laughs> I, I, believe, I believe that, you know, people's yeah. self-expression yeah. yeah. is what makes them unique. Yeah, absolutely. It's style, you know, style. So this young lady in orange had a question. Did we had room for one more? And um, my name is Tara. I am a costume designer from Toronto. Uh, my question is: How do you create the space and time where you can be imaginative, creative, and do continuous research while managing and overseeing your department and meeting the demands demands of a production, especially on smaller productions where we don't have like a 30, 60 person team? You said that was the last question, and that was yeah, the girl. biggest question. <laughs> 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 okay, how much time you got? No. Um, okay, yeah. E big or small, uh, you have to be creative. You know, you have to think creatively. People expect that of you. And you have to look for support. You have to not be afraid to ask for help. And you have to be open. You have to be open to ideas. You know, you have to let your energy receive uh, ideas that come from all different kinds of places. So you actually um, need to not uh, feel the stress of, of uh, you know, somebody wants a bigger paycheck than they got them the last time they worked with you. And, you know, how are they? You need to ask for help. And if those kinds of things are not the things that um, you want to do that block your creative spirit, then you need to have help with ha having one person who's just going to be involved with the hiring of people or, you know, the HR person. You need to have that HR person. And uh, if you can't, if you've got to do the hiring and the thinking, then you've got to divide that. You, gotta, you have to be strict. You got to put up those boundaries because your creative source is in way, way important, too important to let another side of this, which is a little bit more like the business side, uh, block you know, what you all are going to achieve because eventually once you get that team together, they're going to all come to you at once for your know, what do you want this to look like? What do you want that to look like? And you've got to be like centered and ready for that. So I learned and I've learned through the years that um, I was, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I can channel like stress into art. Mm -hmm. And so there's a little bit of that that you can do, but that's not the best way. You really do have to like breathe and do some breathing you may want to do some yoga you might want to do some meditation you need to do the things that open you up and when it's time to be creative you have a door that is closed those are your boundaries this is the time mm -hmm. for you to be the artist that you are not the manager thank you wow
Well, that is the perfect note to end on. Um, can we just thank you, Ruth, so much for such a generous, <laughs> generous, um, meaningful <laughs> conversation. We are so blessed with your spirit, with your energy, with your wisdom, and the work. The work that you have given to the world means so much. And we can't thank you enough for being the trailblazer, the culture shifter, the agenda setter that you are, and we can't wait to see what you do next. So oh, awesome. thank you so much for having me. And I didn't see any of you, but I could feel your energy as well. And, and thank you for coming and listening to this. Yeah, wonderful. I'm gonna give you thank you. <laughs> Goodbye, Ruth. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Yeah. Nice. Thanks for putting up with me and my messing up the questions, like picking everyone. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Tiff, for having me. Enjoy the rest of your nights.